Hey, it's Guy B from Vital MX. Welcome to the first episode of The Inside Line, presented by Thor. If you wanted to draw a parallel between a couple of extremely successful teams in auto racing and our sport, a good one might be with Team Penske and the Monster Energy Pro Circuit Kawasaki team. They recently hit a big milestone with Adam Cienciarulo's Supercross win in Vegas. That gave them their 150th win in that series, and you can add another 113 MX wins and a total of 30 titles. Of course, their version of the captain is Mitch Payton, who created Pro Circuit after his own riding days ended due to a serious crash in a desert race. Over the years, they've had great equipment, as well as a stellar lineup of talented riders, all of which led to where we are today. We recorded this just before the weekend race at Muddy Creek. There may have been some chips and dip involved, along with a few frosty beverages. But enough of that, let's drop the gate and dive into this one. Just a quick note, there are less than a handful of adult words in here that'd make sensitive listeners cringe. It's nothing that anyone older than a small child hasn't heard before, but we left them in because they fit in the context of the conversation. You'll see what we mean. All right, welcome to this episode of the Inside Line podcast from Vital MX, and we've got Mitch Payton here. We missed you in High Point. Yep, I uh, I decided not to go because th- for, I don't know, about the last three or four years, if I go to Mammoth, I usually go to the National, and then fly home Sunday, and then drive up there, and by the time I get there, I'm, I'm tired, so I decided this, this year to, like, go up Friday with the kids, and we went fishing on Saturday and Sunday, and then uh, I went to the mini bike races Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then drove home Thursday, and I'm here today. With Team Green, you also get to see the, the future talent and keep an eye on those guys. Yeah, I mean they've they've got they've got a lot of really good prospects for the future right now. So like I think as long as they can keep you know keep the tank full, then that should be good. And if if not, we always have to have our eyes open to other people too. You've hit a couple big milestones recently. You know, Adam scored the 150th Supercross win in Vegas, um, and then I think it's 120 some national wins. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, Adam was 150 and then outdoors is like somewhere around one or maybe not 120 yet. Cause I think we're like at 167 or one six or 267 or 260. I'm not positive. I, I haven't counted it myself. And then what? 30 number ones on the, the doors of the truck. Yep. We've missed a couple though. How hard is that? You know, the, to the ones that, that get away <clears throat> Yeah. yeah, because it, it it really sucks. Because I mean, if you if you get really close to getting it and you and you lose it, then you kind of wasted a whole year. It feels like you know, and like the difficulty to win one, you got to be you got to be there first of all before you can win it. So like getting there and staying there and then getting getting close and knowing you can or should get it, you know that that gets irritating. I think in in the last few years we've had more competition too. You know add husky back into the mix um ktm guys have stepped up Mm -hmm. it's gotten tougher it for sure has i think i think that the uh like the depth of the class like if you look at 250 class outdoors especially like the whole top 10 is really fast you know like they're all they're all good riders but the you know you'll always see a couple kids excel every year and like you know the past two years you know joey lost a championship at Vegas and then Adam actually lost two at Las Vegas by like one point and two points so like that's pretty damn close did you ever envision that kind of success Mm, I think well Bones was there too like when we first started in 91 we definitely when we decided to do it we wanted we my biggest thing was I didn't want to get laughed at you know like so I, I wanted to make sure that we could be competitive and be good and then you know, we, we always thought it would be good for the business, you know, like if we showed people that, you know, a shop that that makes performance parts can, can race with the factories head up, heads up and win, then that should, that should drive us business. So that's been the philosophy since the beginning. What are the biggest changes that you've seen over that time? Is it the equipment? Is it the, the talent of the, the riders out there? I think it's a couple of them, you know, like the like the first years obviously like say 91 92 whatever it was you know it was all two strokes and it was two strokes until like 2004 you push it really far and you get you get an advantage and then the longer 
you stay in that class, you know, like everybody else slowly catches up, you know, so there becomes more parity. So at the end, you know, there was there was other good two strokes, you know, KTM came in and that was that was good racing too. Um, Yamaha had a good bike, Honda had a bike, you know, Suzuki, there, everybody was pretty close. And then the biggest biggest change in a long time was 2004 when, or actually Yamaha had them before, but Honda and Cowie and Suzuki had them in 2004, which was the four stroke. So that was a whole new learning curve for us because I, I kind of, I didn't really like them, you know, so we sort of avoided them almost, you know, and did, didn't really mess with them too much. We just stayed with doing the race race stuff, which was all two stroke. So then we, we had to get kind of going quick on that. And a lot of that, you know, I go back and, and I have to thank like Drino Miller who came to work for us. And Drino was like a big, big help to the team because he brought, you know, a ton of experience. And then he brought in like a, a process or a, a way that he wanted it, that he believed it needed to be done, you know, like which I probably wouldn't have known how to do it in, in that manner. And so I think that's helped us a ton and has kept us, you know, moving forward and we're always, we're always trying stuff and always working to evolve the bike. And then, you know, now as you see, there's a lot of competitive four strokes and then everybody pushes it a little further, a little further, a little further to try to get the new advantage and sometimes you get bit. So that's just nature of the beast. Yeah, I guess there's the performance parts that you guys build or, or there's stock parts you also have to use that you don't have the control over yeah and 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 you know like some of those parts that are stock parts maybe aren't designed for the level that we take them to and then you have to you know then you got to go back to figuring out why it broke is it strong enough and then if not you got to remanufacture the parts yourself so it does get it's a little bit time consuming and it's real expensive so, of all the, the number one plates you guys have earned, are, are there any that stand out to you? Hmm. I mean, obviously the first ones were massive because we had never done that. And then we got to where we had won, you know, quite a few or a few Supercross titles, but we had never won an outdoor title. And then when Ricky came on the team, uh, Ricky... He was great at Supercross, but he was young at it and made some mistakes the first year. One, I think he won three races, but crashed out of a couple. And then, but when we got to outdoors, he was amazing. And so he was the first one to win us an outdoor title, which was, you know, I don't, I mean, we just never have done it. So it was a big milestone for us, for sure. Yeah, I remember a race at Glen Helen where he was using a chain link fence on the outside of the corner as part of the berm. And uh, he was a gnarly he, guy. Yeah, he was fun to watch. So a, a new rider stepping into the truck, all that stuff has to be kind of intimidating, the history and, and everything else. Maybe in some fashion it is, but the ones, that, the, one, the ones that it seems to work the best for, or it seems as though it does, a lot of those kids we already kind of help. So they're, they're sort of around the shop. They know Bones. You know, because Bones probably helps do their amateur stuff, you know, and so they'll they'll know me because we help do the engines. So, like, they kind of, I think we knock a little bit of that edge off because if we help them as an amateur, we kind of know the family and the kids, so it's not so much of a starstruck uh, program, I think. Familiarity. Well, you're just a little more comfortable, you know. It's not such a wow factor, you know, like it takes... It, it's a little, it's, there's still a wow factor, but I think it just makes it a little more comfortable for them where they feel at ease a little more. Going way back, I think, I think the first time I saw you guys was out at Crone Raceway and rolling a 125 Husky out of the, the truck. I saw the name on the side in Pro Circuit and I'm going, man, that's a great name, but man, I don't know how these guys are going to do it building parts for 125 Huskies because those were there pretty, was none of them. pretty rare back in the day. And slow. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was just something, you know, like after I got hurt, I got the Husky shop and I wanted to, uh, I raced a 125 Husky in the desert and uh, they were always, they were known to be slow. 
and I it, I just couldn't figure out in my mind why like if I want if it was a 125 why it couldn't be as fast as the other 125 so we, we wanted to work on it and try to figure that out and then we kind of slowly figured it out you know and part of it was the engine part of it was the pipe part of it was a carburetor you know and just all the little pieces and then you sort of learn and then I thought we would sell a lot of 125 Husky stuff but there wasn't a lot of those bikes out there so then uh, I think it was Jody and Jody talked me into he says hey you, you should do a 250 Husky because there's way more 250 Huskies than 125s and I'm like ah oh, no I like the 125 so we did a 250 Husky and then that that sold really well then we did a 390 Husky and that you know then 125 Husky sales were tiny compared to those two models and then he says why don't you do a Japanese bike like there's if you think those are great you should do something else and I think we did the next one we did was a four I did a 465 Suzuki pipe and that was great and then I think we finally did a 125 Honda pipe and then that outsold everything so it, then you're like wow we should do all the Japanese bikes kind of a launching pad but but was that 125 husky sort of a perfect scenario for you to kind of learn about all the tuning part of it yeah it was you got to start somewhere you know and it was a nobody really expected you to do anything with it anyway so it was it was challenging it was fun and i don't know it was it was fun because i i remember we we would go to corona raceway and, and uh and harry clem helped me when i first started because he was a he was an engine guy over at DG, and I thought he could help me, you know, with it a little bit. And Harry was pretty cool. He he knew, you know, kind of showed me how to degree an engine and d did some of the stuff with the engine. But he kind of didn't know pipes, so then I had to go out and like uh, I wanted to learn how to do pipes. And I remember Dave Miller did pipes, but then to really understand how they got the numbers instead of just backtracking through the stock pipe. Uh, I wanted to learn, and then there was a guy, Paul Turner, that worked at Honda, and I got a hold of Paul, and he kind of helped me get going on uh, on the right way to do it, and I think that was a, a big, a big uh, evolution for us. Yeah, Paul later did Rock Shocks. So. Yeah, he killed it. Yeah. Like, which I thought I told him he was wasting his time. Nobody would buy a fork for a mountain bike because <laughs> it'd be heavy, and he he killed it. Describe what the the scene was like in in Southern California back in the day. Guys could race five nights a week, and uh, I think I think Bones did. He came from uh, Arizona, and that was one of his things that he wanted to do was he wanted to do five days in a row of racing, and they they bounced around from you could go Orange County, Ascot Wednesday, Orange County Thursday, or or Corona, and then you could go Saddleback. And then you could go Carlsbad or Saddleback sometimes or to the dunes on Sunday. And then there was De Anza sometimes. So, like, there was a lot of racing. And bikes were cheap. and Bikes were cheap. Full gates and everything else. Entry fees were cheap. They used to do $5,000 purses, $10,000 purse for a big pro race to get everybody out there. Man, you've had to evolve as the, as the sport has changed. You know, two strokes, four strokes, carbs fuel injection what what's been the hardest part in in all of that mm. i mean it's kind of, it got to be kind of a little bit of a constant re-education yeah everything and even like you know suspension like like bones aside it a fork used to be oil with a an aluminum tube in it with a few holes and a spring and you would raise the oil level or else you would go from five weight to ten weight or ten weight to twenty weight and then you know then they they just kept getting more sophisticated to where the point now where a fork is like two shocks inside so it's got a valve stack and compression and rebound and all this you know it's like that was never it wasn't even it wasn't even close to that back then that's more sophisticated and then the bikes are good so to make a change even on suspension you know the you got to do not only suspension but you got to do like chassis stuff to it and then when you go back to the motor, you're always evolving on that. Yeah, and electronics now with the way everything is and taking data. You know, we never had data before. And it's just, it's just, it just keeps going. I guess we're building factory, you know, because it's a production-based series here, you're having to, or the companies that are having to build factory bikes so that you guys can race there. 
they're trying, that's for sure. Everybody's doing more to it. I've heard you say in the past that you couldn't go racing at this level without support from, like, Monster. Um, what, what, is, what does it cost to go racing in a, a year? I'm not positive because I don't know the number off the top of my head, but, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't do it at the level we do it currently if it was just, you know, Pro Circuit and Kawasaki. You know, we, we're lucky. We, we have, you know, Monster's been a great sponsor to our, our team since 2005. And then, you know, we've got other, other sponsors like, you know, Fox and Scott and Maxima. And, like, you, you start adding them up. Um, you know, even, like, when you add up the amount of, like, rental. They've been with us since the beginning. And, like, Dunlop. The amount of tires that we go through nowadays compared to like back in the day if i had to buy all those tires you couldn't afford to buy them so it just everything has just evolved to making it really expensive watching different other racing series nascar or indycar and even f1 occasionally they make changes to try and make it less expensive to go racing is is there something that we should be looking at to do that Mm. Well, if I tell you what I really think, it's very negative towards some people's thoughts. But, you know, like, sometimes everybody wants to get together and talk about what we can do to drive down the cost of the factory bike. So, like, we should put more limits on them. And then one time in a meeting I said, if you want to help everybody in the pits then the best thing we could do is maybe drop a couple of races because if if the series was slightly shorter maybe supercross and and outdoor if it was slightly shorter the guys may potentially be able to race a longer career and then what everybody doesn't realize is like the manufacturers still hold the biggest burden you know like of the sport because they you know like whether it's my team or star or factory connection or husky or ktm or suzuki you know the we're we're all out there racing but then the guy's racing for bonuses from the manufacturer you know the the purse money is tiny it's not not good enough so if i guarantee if they had to race for only purse money i think a lot of people would quit so if we want to help the manufacturers, if they, if they could take away the liability of, say, five races a year, that would make their budget better. So, like, if we dropped maybe two Supercrosses and four Nationals, that's six races. That's a phenomenal amount of money. And that would, and that would not only help the factory teams and the satellite teams, it would help the privateers. I mean, I... It, I know, and I'm going to get flack for saying that, but that's what I really believe. Sometimes the the way the schedule bounces around, too, in, in both series, it's it's a little rough, It's too. expensive. Yeah. That's why you see normally, if you see a lights guy, it's, it's, I mean, you do the math on it. And if you had to race and you were a privateer, you'd ride uh, 250 <laughs> West Coast. And you'd base out of California somewhere because you can hit them all within driving. When you go East Coast, you're crisscrossing and got gaps and stuff. So it, it's East Coast is a lot more money to race. Hey, Guyby here, and it's time for a quick pit stop. This is just a reminder that the Inside Line is presented by Thor. Celebrating 50 years of racing heritage, the first, the forever, Thor Motocross. All right, let's dive back into our conversation with Mitch. You've always gravitated towards the the smaller or the smaller bikes. Is is there a particular reason for it? We just never in the beginning, you know. Like I, you know, like I said, I always liked 125s anyway. But that was that was our uh, opportunity to go race. Actually, before before that, we were offered a, a factory 250 program to run before the Honda program, and I didn't know that we were ready for it, and I said no. And then the Honda thing came up and we took it. And then that lasted two years and then we went to Kawasaki and we've been there, you know, ever since. So 
I like I like the class. I like the history of us doing it. And then, you know, like, would I like to have a 450 guy? Yeah, it'd be, it would be fun. It would be cool to do that, but I wouldn't do it at the cost of the 250 thing. You had the occasional dabbles in 450? Yeah, and we did it because of, uh, of our, you know, with Brock, basically, he, he won and, and, and it wasn't able to uh, defend it. So it was, you know, what were we going to do? We needed to do it. So we, Kawasaki and us and Monster, everybody pitched in and we did it. And it was, it was good, but it was a lot of, it made me aware of like the difficulties of doing both though. Like, because I, I did feel like you couldn't, it, for me it was weird because you couldn't watch, you know, you couldn't watch all the 250 practice and then stay and watch all the 450 practice or you're not talking to your guys. So I thought that was, that was a weird feeling, I think. So you have to have, to do it correct, I think you gotta have definitely two separate groups of people. Yeah, and getting pulled in two different directions. Yep. You know, you've got your consumer products, the racing side, and development. Where are you the happiest? I like, I like the racing, and I like the development side, and then I like when we have a good product. Like, we just worked on the new Yamaha 65, and you know, we needed to come up with a pipe for it, and then uh, you know, pipe and silencer, and then Bones did suspension for uh, the production bike. You know, like, and so like, it's, it's, it's challenging. So it's kind of fun to do something new, and then, you know, like, uh, we did, we already did it. We have an engine spec for it, and it's, and you go back and dyno it, and like, if it, if you do good, it's gratifying. So like, I like that. How exciting is it to see a new two-stroke in in the game there? I like it. I think it's a really good bike. I think it's every bit as good as the KTM or the Husky for sure already. What what's the trickiest bike you've ever built? <laughs> I don't know. What would that be? What would be the trickiest bike we ever built? The Peak Honda was was an amazing motorcycle only because nobody nobody ever expected us to do it i think and then i know swink said in some interview we seemed like we were uh disorganized the first year and we really were but it wasn't because we were disorganized it was because it was a brand new team and we couldn't get answers from anybody and if you've ever tried to put a team together to get somebody to to commit sometimes is really difficult and it was so last minute we never truly put a motorcycle together until Thursday night in in Orlando in the motel you know like from the finished product you know we had we had a test bike and the test bikes were red and all that and we you know we had you know Jim Hale and Jim Hale uh, was AXO and we were AXO so he he got the clothes and we got those kind of last minute and Troy did the helmets, Troy did the box fans, Kenny Safford did all the the design of the graphics and the look, and Throttle Jockey did the graphics, and we even got the graphics that year uh, from Throttle Jockey, and they were just uh, printed sheets. We had to cut them out with scissors, because we didn't, they didn't have dyes yet. So like, it was, and then we had matching awnings and all this kind of cool stuff. We, I wanted a framework to the, two trucks would back under one and not use easy ups because I thought that looked cheap um, and it and it was it was a mess to get it all done but then but then they were like but when we got our awning finally up and then the bikes were just they were badass and everybody everybody thought they sounded amazing and they ran amazing and like they're like dude look at those guys like that was there was that was a pretty amazing t and then we go back and look at them now i remember skip and jeremy came down one night and we were all looking at his bike up front and we're like it's not that bitching and they're like but it really was for the time but now everything's evolved so far like there's so much more trick stuff that you do to a bike you were doing a lot of different things with I think team look and, and everything else that other people weren't doing. I did that because I, uh, I mean, I would have never done it that way probably, except for, I think it was in 88. I think 88 for, 88 or 89. 
I went to the Bob Andrant School for a vacation and I wanted to do something fun. I hadn't done anything since I got hurt that would be like, you know, super bitching for me or whatever. So this guy, Jack Jory, uh, owned the building we were in and he was an off-road driver, like a buggy driver. And uh, so I talked to him. I said, hey, let's go to the Bond Run School. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, let's go do that. So we, we did that. And I had so much fun and that I decided I wanted to race like uh, cars, like SCCA, like started off with showroom stock even. And went and did that and then I got into it and then did pretty good at, at all the SCCA local stuff and did some nationals. And then when you're kind of done there, the biggest thing you can do in the, like a endurance series was like an IMSA series. So I started racing some IMSA races and then a, a buddy of mine, Lance Stewart, drove for Mazda and he was a factory GTU driver. And when I went to the races, I was impressed like how, there was like Mazda, Nissan, Jaguar, Toyota, you know, all these factory teams, Audi, Porsche, and you know, like, I really liked how like the car, you know, was, the car would be like, blue and white with yellow or whatever the color schemes were and all that and their shirts were all bitching the awnings were matched and you know like you just it all was tied together and at that time like even say factory honda or cowie they didn't do crew shirts you know they had like a collared golf shirt with maybe an embroidery on it or iron on or something like that some guys wore t-shirt you know like it just wasn't what I thought and I and and I remember telling Jim Hale about that and I'm like how sick would it be like if it was just all like like if you thought of NASCAR and did it just that way and like he was like in love with the idea and so when we did that it was the first time that that was kind of done in in motocross so it and now if you look around everybody does it so it's it was cool to bring that over here and then you know leave it you know, you, you mentioned your accident a couple of times. For the for the people that don't know, um, can you run through that? I used to race. I, I raced desert, and uh, I rode the. I was riding the 125 class in District 37, and then uh, that year we rode a couple off road races, which was like the Parker 400 and Baja 500. And uh, it was the end of the year in September, and there was a an event out at. Uh, California City and it was a, a timed start and it was always a cool thing if you could win an overall on a 125 and there was a couple guys in the past that I always looked up to that like this guy Tommy Brooks he won one and probably Bruce Ogilvy I think uh, I don't know if Bruce ever won one on a 125 and I don't even know if maybe Larry I don't know there were Andy Kirker maybe one it's just different guys periodically could do it and so like I wanted to do I wanted to try to win one and like it was a time start and so you're you didn't have that massive start and my I think I can't remember what row is on there was eight people per row or something like that but anyway it was kind of a tight race and I thought and me and Larry were Larry Rosser were talking and he goes you know you might be able to win this like it, if it's tight enough like maybe because of the time start and everybody's going to have dust and all that stuff and I'm like you know I might be right and it was the weekend of my birthday and then the next week me and Larry were going to go ride a, a, the 8 hour race in Grand Junction Colorado on a 250 and then Husky had kind of already talked to me for the following year what they wanted to do and all this kind of stuff so I was pretty all pumped and then I, I remember I took off and passed a bunch of people and went to the first pit and then I said what place am I in they said like eighth and I said overall and they said yeah but I started like four rows or something back so I knew I was doing pretty good then I got to the next check and I was like I don't know like fourth or fifth but all those guys that started in front of me too so I'm like man if I keep doing this you know time wise uh, I'll be all right and then they had talked about it at the riders meeting there was a downhill that they recommended that you walk down and they said it was so steep that none of their people had rode down it. And I'm like, ah, there's never, it's impossible. And I mean, me and Larry were talking about it. I'm like, what do you think? And he goes, no. He goes, you might be dead engine, but you know, and I'm like, I know, there's no way. They wouldn't, what are they gonna do? Just drop us down a cliff or something, you know? And 
So I got going down it and uh, I fell down one time and I got up and I remember I was going and then uh, I was kind of just sitting on the bike, dead engine, washing the front end to slow it down. And I remember getting back on it and then going and I remember the rear wheel hit a rock and when the rear wheel went up in the air, the thing, you know, like it wasn't on the ground no more, so it was gaining speed. And then it was just like killing it down that hill. And I just remember bracing my arms and then just, I think the last thing I remember is the wind being knocked out of me. And just going Ugh, like that. And then I woke up and laying flat and there's people around me and it's kind of in and out like concussion or something like that. And my elbow was bleeding and they said, you know, we got, we got people coming. And then I, my brother was in that race and like there was, some, I think, uh, I think Cordis Brooks was there. He was watching, he wasn't even racing. And then my brother got there and this guy, Ed Zarp, and they're like, no, no, don't move, don't move. And I remember then Rescue 3 got there and I, I just thought, man, I couldn't, I felt like I knocked the wind out of me. And then every time I'd always knocked the wind out of myself, you know, I always felt like I put my knees up. And then I, I'm like, look down and my knee, or my legs are straight out. And I'm like, something's weird. I'm like, something's not okay. And they're like, don't move. And I'm like, hmm. And then pretty soon, and I didn't even know it, and they had taken my boot off. I said, wiggle your toes. And I, and I did, and they said, didn't move. And I'm like, fuck. I knew. And I'm like, I am fucked. And I'm like, just, I knew right then. So I'm like, I was, I'm like, I don't know. There's nothing you can really do about it. And I, I had a friend of mine, uh, Mitch Mays, who had got hurt like the year before. And, and like he was kind of like him and AC were like two guys that I really really looked up to and I remember he got hurt and we went and saw him and I knew Mitch and uh, well they got me in the hospital or helicopter and went, took me to the hospital and then just I mean you could go hours on that but that's how I got hurt I've heard people suggest that Pro circuit might not be what it is, min minus that accident. You know, you, you might have continued racing and instead of headed the direction you headed. That's probably true. I, I was bored out of my mind, and it's the only thing I knew, and I had to do something. I mean, I, yeah, I, I probably would have been some scraggly desert rat, like. <laughs> but I would, like, I, I loved it. I liked, I liked what I did. I enjoyed it, but. You know, it changed courses, and like I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think I'm deprived. Well, people don't realize also, you know, we talked about the SoCal scene back in the day, but what a big deal desert racing was back in the day too. The, the size of the fields, the the available area to ride then. Yeah, I mean, it was it was good. I mean, it was it was kind of one of those things where we just we started off just going to the desert and riding for fun, you know, and then. Uh, I don't know. I, I wanted to race motocross, and my dad took me to a couple of local races, and and he said, "This is stupid," and he was he was pissed off because it was expensive, and we sat around all day, and he goes, "We can go to the desert and ride all day." He goes, "If you want to race, you can race desert," and then uh, I think I, I rode a little bit of high school motocross, and uh, it was fun because it was just all of our buddies, and actually I was a I was like a 125 desert guy and I wound up I was the 500 cc expert high school motocross championship winner one year and I just borrowed my brother's 390 husky I never we didn't even never even did anything suspension just just rode it which school did you go to back then Norco High okay um the league at Corona Raceway yeah yep okay I went to North High yeah North you guys had a big team yeah yeah now we had that was, I, that was our big advantage back in the days. We had a lot of guys. We did too. We had like I have a picture in my desk, and I'll bet we had the best year. We we knew that the only way we could win is just to have everybody ride. So we would get we got some girls to ride XR 75s in the mini bike class. We would have we we would get everybody to ride if we could con them into it. Like we'll we'll take you to the race. And then we had a couple of kids that lived in Norco. It rode their bike through the hills to Corona Raceway. And then at night, they just get a ride back. <laughs> so it was pretty funny. Yeah, it, it, definitely a different time back then. Yeah. 
Hey, Guyby here. Sorry for the interruption, but we've got a quick word from one of our sponsors. From tubes to tires to MX jerseys, gear bags, hard parts, and a huge selection of dirt bikes, Chaparral Motorsports has everything you need to keep you roosting on the tracker trail. Check out chapmoto.com. That's chapmoto.com. All right, let's get back into it. Man, you, you've had an awful lot of talent run through the team. Who are some of your favorite riders over the years? Mm, that's I. I don't want to say we have a favorite, but I mean, the only way you can do it is just like one time we went up front, or somebody did some interview, and we just started the front, you know. And it was like the first year we had uh, McGrath and Swink and Jeremy Buell and Steve Lampson, and like really all four of those guys were awesome super cool guys i mean jeremy wound up you know being the king of all time supercross and swink won a couple of titles and truly was like a, a unbelievable talent back then like phenomenal and like he got sidetracked and it's terrible what happened and then jeremy buell won races for us and i think he truly i think would have won the championship the next year and he broke his wrist right away. And then he was forced out of the class by the point system back then. And I think if he could have been in the class a little longer, I think Buell could have been a champion and that would have helped him probably get a ride or something like that. And then Lampson became, what, a couple time national champ and had a factory ride forever. So like, those four guys are amazing. And then go to 93 and Jimmy Gaddis, like nobody thought he could win and he did. He's gnarly. And go to 94, we had Ryan Hughes, you know, which was kind of a standout guy for us. 95, Pichon and Rhino. Um, Pichon won two titles. You go to 97, you go to Ricky. Ricky, 98. And then probably, and then, you know, like, you know, Pingree won races for us too that, if he wouldn't have broke his femur one year, I think he truly might have won that championship that year. Um, and then, you know, Pedro Gonzalez from Mexico. Nobody expected that. He won a race. I mean, who am I missing? Like, there's so many good guys. I mean. Uh, that Villapoto guy wasn't bad. No, but I mean, there's even in between those guys. I mean, like, right. you, had, you had certain guys that were pretty damn good. I mean, Dobb. Dobb came over in 93. Right. And didn't win a Supercross, but he won Unadilla. And our bike wasn't like, it wasn't as good as our old Hondas then, you know, and he rode the wheels off it. So there, yeah, Volan, Volan rode for us after Ricky left and he won a Supercross, which wasn't his, probably his, you know, best Forte. thing. Yeah. yeah. And then that year he was ripping outdoors. And then two weeks before Glen Helen uh, crashed and hit his head. You know, like, and had a little bit of concussion going in. And, you know, you look back at those things, and those could have been big, big changes. And then Nathan Ramsey, Ramsey won. Like, that was awesome. I love that one. Um, Shea Bentley, Shea Bentley won. Like, it just keeps going, you know. And then you, then you go, well, so did Nathan. Nathan won, and so did Ben Townley, won with the DNF. And then, you know, you, you move up to, like, that that era where you had Villapoto. Like, that was pretty gnarly. And then, don't forget Langston. Like, Runcott. And, like, you just keep going. They're all... Keep taking off names, yeah. Well, I mean, but, I mean, like, G, GL could have... GL probably left a couple outdoor titles on the table because he, you know, he got hurt at Vegas at press day and then ripped his ankle out at Hangtown the next year or whatever and he was pretty gnarly how can you say like Ivan was incredible like the, I, the first year in 04 like Ivan and and Roncata would win both heat races and then finish 1-2 in the main so there was Roncata was like like a the typical gnarly talented French guy you know like anytime he could pull the trigger and go for it 
and then Ben I loved Ben like Ben was super cool like having him and and Velo on the team everybody thought we were gonna have problems with those guys and I mean they be they became great friends you know like as the season went on and then it was good to see those guys and I mean, they didn't give each other any slack, but they never put a dirty wheel on each other. And that was, that was pretty honorable of both of them. And then probably into the Porcel, Porcel and Weimer, yep. And then Porcel, Weimer, Porcel was like super talented. And Jake, you know, like we, we saw Jake when he rode for Factory Connection and RV was pushing us to get him. and. You know, like the year before, he raced Dunge for the Supercross title, and then the next year he wins it. That was awesome, and he, and like he w he was good outdoors too. Like those guys are there's so many, like you just got to keep going. That's, you just got to I don't know. They're all they're all good. It just goes right up till now. You know, like you look at where we where we were at that moment, and then right now, and you you look at who we have. And, you have to say Adam's a super talent. I believe Forkner's a super talent. Um, I believe Joey is a mix indoor or outdoor because he's done it. You know, he's won Supercross races. He's won outdoor races. He's been in title fights. He just hasn't finished it, you know. A little up and down, but, yeah, no, I'm, I'm pumped on all those guys. Yeah, the one, two, three, four at Vegas. Even, like, Hanny, you know, like... <laughs> Hanny rode for us, and I think he, like, he went down to a title fight with Tomac in Supercross, and then he tried to go inside of him, was going to take his front wheel, wound up falling, and that blew him out, and then Tickle wound up winning that year, and then, the like I said, we we're talking about outdoors, and then with Baggett, and Baggett at Daytona, what, two years in a row? Or three, or what do you do? Like, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. He wasn't killing it in regular Supercross, and then we'd go to Daytona, and he would annihilate him. And then outdoors, the the year he won the title, like, and they there was a lot of hot races that year, and like, I remember. I think I was at Mount Morris, and I think he did that the last four laps. I think he was like three seconds a lap faster, and I'm like, dude, if he could do that like every lap, he'll he'll catch him. And that's where his visor was on backwards and like, he caught him. You know, like there's just, they're all, every one of them that's came through there's been pretty good. Yeah, and then Dean, you know, like, they go, they fight it out. And then you got, one year we had Dean, Tyla, Blake. I mean, we had four guys and I think all four of them won races. Austin Stroop, like, I mean, there's just, they're all great. All right, here's a quick uh, lightning round. Supercross or motocross? Which one do I like better? I like both. Um, I like both. I really do. I like, I like supercross when we're doing it, and then when you get outdoors, I still dig outdoors. I do think what I said, though, I'm not going to change my opinion about it, I think that Supercross could be a couple shorter, and I think the Nationals could be as short as eight. And I'm gonna, I know people are gonna hate me for saying that, but it's what I, you're asking me, and that's my honest opinion. And I feel that a little more time off for these guys, and we're gonna lose them. You know, like Ricky only rode, you know, 10 years, and RV rode nine. You know, like Dunge quit now. You know, Bubba's gone. Like, Chad's only got a couple more. And, like, those, that's some major star power that, that our sport spent, you know, five years building their names up. And then you got a few years to use them, and then they leave. You know, and, like, A, we need to do a better job of building up the personalities of the guys. And, and I know that's hard to do if they're not, you know, winning. Because then they say, oh, well, he's not winning, so how are we going to do that? So probably building up the new guys so that we have some star power. And then once they have star power, we need to keep them. You know, like, and if they're beat up and they're hurt, then they're, they're gonna say it's, I'm over it. 
it's too much. Like we gotta we gotta worry about them a little bit. You know, you don't you don't take like a a prized racehorse does what four races a year, you know, and then gets ready to do those races. And you don't you don't take a racehorse to the fair, you know. Do you you don't do that? Right. You don't run them into the ground. Yeah. So like I think. We have to just be cautious, you know, the, the GP guys, they ride, what, 18 rounds or 20 rounds, but that's it. That's still, okay, so if they race 20 GPs, that's still 12 short of what we do. So that's like, let's just do 20 Supercrosses and then you don't do any Nationals, but I like the Nationals. So like, I think we just, if they could work together and abbreviate it slightly, you know, drop the, maybe the couple of Supercrosses where maybe they don't make money and then take that off the schedule and then maybe the same thing with the outdoors, trim it down a little bit so that they're all great quality events. And then, um, you know, give the guys a break. And if they want to, if the promoters are so wanting to do some more events, then put up a big purse, you know, like Monster Cup and do a couple races at the end of the season. And if the guys want to go, then so be it. And if they don't, somebody's gonna make a lot of money. Electric start or kick start? I wish I wished we were smart enough or the ind- industry was smart enough to make that illegal a long time ago. I think, I don't think it affects racing and all it does is make the bike heavier and they're all gonna have it. So it's gonna raise the cost and it is, it's an awesome feature, you know, that that like the regular guy loves like after you've had an electric start bike nobody wants to kick them no more but if you didn't know it was there you wouldn't worry about it but it's here and we're not going to turn back so now everybody's going to have it uh neck braces or no neck braces that one's personal for me but in my own opinion i don't believe in them okay Two-stroke or four-stroke? Both. I like both, but you know, like you can't turn like can't turn back time. So like we've we went down this road, and I don't see the Japanese willing to revert back to two strokes. I think I think we're here, and I think we're here. And but like. All the mini bike classes, leave them two stroke. Everybody make a two stroke because everybody's dad can work on that bike. It's cheap. They're they're competitive. They sound good. It's still a good bike. I like the 125. It's a good it's a good stepping stone off a mini bike instead of putting a guy right on a 250F. I do like that. Um, I think the Woods guys like 250 and 300s to ride, and then yeah. I think there's room for both, but it sort of does cut up the market a little bit. You know, like in the old days, in the in the '70s or '80s, you know, if you think back, I remember I remember Daryl Bassani told me the the best he ever did was when Yamaha made like a DT1, and they just made that one bike. And then, if you wanted to go, or if you wanted to ride it around town, you could ride it. Or if you wanted to take it to an enduro, you pulled the lights off and leave the speedo on it and if you want to race motocross you pulled it all off and then if you made a pipe it fit all those so like those days are a little bit gone and then i think what happened to our like when the heyday of the big numbers we actually kind of split our industry in half when three wheelers came involved or four wheelers so now you have if you wanted to go to the desert there wasn't a three wheeler and there wasn't a four wheeler you had a dune buggy or a jeep or a motorcycle and then then all of a sudden if you can imagine like you'd bought a three-wheeler and it looks harmless because it's like a tricycle every kid grew up riding a tricycle what's safer than a tricycle and you put a motor in it so and think about that like if a wife didn't want to balance you'd go to the desert and ride a, a three-wheeler and just you'd pull up and stop and then take off and then those became maybe not so safe and then um <laughs> Then they go to four wheelers and the same thing you know you can go to the desert you don't have to be talented to ride it you could 
you know, you can ride it just for fun. You can hunt on it. You won't get stuck. You won't fall over. And so we now you've got this off-road market that used to be all just dirt bikes, and we, we kind of split it with them. And now we got now it's it's the, the now we got four wheelers side by sides and motorcycles. So you're kind of got three things you can use off road and the family to save money. Now you don't have to go spend forty grand and build a, a dune buggy. You go buy a Razor or a Terex or whatever. Yep. Split the pie in smaller pieces though. Yep. Sorry to intrude here, but just a quick reminder, the Inside Line is brought to you by Thor. Celebrating 50 years of racing heritage, the first, the forever, Thor Motocross. All right, let's get back to it. We may have spotted you scanning the, the forum on, on your phone. Uh, what, what's the upside and downside on social media? Actually, I really feel as though... Um, Well, you can't turn it back. Once again, it, it when it started, it started. And like, I got two kids and every time they grab my phone, they look at Instagram. It drives me nuts or YouTube or whatever. So like, I realize there's nothing you can do about it. And, you know, Vital has been around, you know, I don't even know what year it started. Uh, it's coming up on 12 years now. Really? So, yeah. <laughs> but the, where, where I remember it blowing up was, like, uh, remember the Alessi-Ivan deal? Oh, my God. You could go in there every day and there was some new comment or somebody that had an opinion and stuff like that. And I remember that's kind of maybe the first that I remember it being kind of like where people were actively doing it all the time. And, uh, you know, now it's like, Everybody's got an opinion, and everybody yes. can make a column, right? So, it's it's the way it is, really. Do you guys have, do the riders have to watch themselves a little more than they used to? They should, yeah, because I don't think I don't think you can. You know, I tell like if a guy is an idiot, if a guy's an idiot and he attacks you, like I've I've really wanted to go on there before and like when I'm getting slammed on something and tell somebody to fuck off like let them have it and I just know if I do I'm just gonna pour gasoline on it so I'm like nope I'm gonna eat it I'm just gonna shut up (laughs) and I'll take it there's a you know and and honestly like as long as they're reasonable I guess there's nothing wrong like everybody has an opinion like and you can't get 30 people to agree on anything, right? So that's okay. Yeah. Hey, I know it was for a different manufacturer, but it was cool to see your, your kids get a shot at the KJSC this year. It was it was really cool. And, and uh, that whole group over there, like I got to tell you, like I already knew it was a really good program. Like it was really solid. But like when they were going to do it, like, they couldn't do it in California, and they couldn't do both the same weekend. And uh, so they said, what about maybe Dallas? And uh, where was it? Dallas and St. Louis. And I'm like, holy crap. I'm like, it's like an excursion. Like, <laughs> we're going to fly to the race, get a hotel, do the whole deal. Which, honestly, it probably made the experience a little bit more fun for them, too. But I, I got to tell you, like, their, their whole group and... You know, I, I told them I was really worried because I said, you know, like, I can't, I can't push the bike myself. And they're like, you don't have to worry about it. And I said, yeah, but my wife, you know, like, she doesn't really know that much. She, you know, like, sometimes they're hard to start. And they said, no, we'll, we'll help. Don't worry about it. We'd rather have her just be the mechanic and then you do your deal. And I'm like, all right. So, like, and I would go back and forth and check on it, but I didn't interfere or whatever. I, I've talked to my son and, and talked to Kristen, but, like, they they handle everything. It, it is an unbelievably professional deal, and like KTM should be patting those guys on the back, and we should all pat them on the back because they they it's like being a king for a day, you know. Like and and to meet some of the people when I was over there, like one guy was from Canada, and like there's a guy from here and there, and like 
they 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 spread it all out and like it's amazing like it it's they treat them good you know the bikes they do a good job the bikes are all all the same you know they they give them like a ground course and what they expect from them and they make them act right and and it's really it's a fun experience i think they just it's like it's if you had to rate it from one to ten i'd probably give it a ten five like it's that good do you push your kids towards racing or do you let them pick and choose i want them to pick yeah they do it every you know they'll they'll do it for a while and then all of a sudden like their buddy joey will want to play football and they're like hey joey's gonna play football we're gonna play football and i'm like here we go again <laughs> but like i want them to do what they want to do how do we make the sport safer uh, yeah <laughs> that one <laughs> It's only my opinion, but we talked to Randy Meninga, member Bones that night, where we were talking to him about the tracks, and I, I, I would like to make the tracks a little bit more difficult. It's kind of hard, because the bikes are so good. Like, so you go back to, say, 91, and there were races that sometimes, Jeremy might be the only guy that would grease the triple in practice and he would actually help Lamson do it. And, and if they could both do it, now we were the only two bikes that did a triple. So now anybody, a 250F guy, can come out of a corner and just gas it, and his bike will get over the triple. So I feel like th that they do lanes where it's like a table, table, double, triple, triple, double into the corner, and they just keep gaining speed the whole time. And I feel as though somehow we gotta slow them down, don't let them build up so much speed. If we have to, put obstacles closer to the corner where they can't, where you can't quad it, or, and the whoops, maybe move the whoops right out of the corner so it's hard to, to blitz the whoops, you know, or whatever, but like, I just think they're, I think the tracks are too fast. And then, when we go outdoors, they have to be cognizant of when you run a bunch of people on a track, you know, once, so do you want it rough and really cobby? So yeah, that's a good idea, but then you gotta be smart enough to know there's, there's a, like, if it's dangerous on a takeoff or something, you gotta use judgment maybe to go clean that up a little bit to, to save a guy's life. Yeah, I, I think a little slower speed's not a bad thing. You know, al almost any race series that I look at, you know, automotive or otherwise, eventually they do a reset. Watkins Glen. Watkins Glen used to go down the front straight, turn left, go down. So that was one, you go through two, and then you drive through the S turns between, like, 1950 guardrails, right? That Armco? Yeah, the Armco barriers. And nobody got hurt there. But then Tommy Kendall drove a GTP car and drove it all the way down the straightaway and then at the end of the straightaway it has a rise in it and then you crest the rise and then you go into what they call like a carousel turn kind of. And you kind of break into the face of that that rise right there and then you sort of let off and then you settle it and then you start going around the corner and he got to there and something happened to the brakes and straight off into the armco barrier on the outside and I mean broke his feet and his legs and everything and it was a pretty bad deal it was in a I believe a Chevy Intrepid thing um, but it really hurt him pretty bad and then after I want to say that accident you look at Watkins Glen now and they run the same straightaway but then at the end of it they put a chicane so you can't you can't enter that big carousel with that head of steam and if you blow your braking going down the straightaway there's a runoff and you can go if your brakes whatever you screw up you just go straight so I think we have to maybe look at what's been done and maybe be smarter about what we're doing too. That, that's a course correction, but you also see things like restrictor plates or 
um, I mean, drag racing, it's not even a quarter mile for the pro cars anymore. And that, that's about as sacred as it gets for for uh, those guys. Or, or I think they've also done uh, spec fuel, you know, rear gear limits. I think we're doing spec fuel for the most case. Yeah. Um, or we have a spec for fuel. I'm not positive what we can do. I don't know. If you want to do it to the bike, that's going to be a difficult thing to... to impose. Because the manufacturers all want to... Full speed ahead? Well, they want to prove their technologies that they're right. working on. And, you know, if you put a cork in it, I don't want to have them be... You know, we did that with sound. Sound hurt power. You know, we're quieter than we were for a long time. And that definitely, you know, pulled the power down on the bikes. So in one way, we have res restricted them, like, massively compared to where we were when four strokes first came out. Um, we, we took away leaded fuel, which is, you know, eco-friendly and, and hurts the power a little bit. I mean, the technology, you're just always going to figure out stuff as we go, but I, I think if we could slow the tracks down, I don't know, that's my opinion. Okay. Hey, Guyby here, and it's time for one more quick pit stop. Chaparral Motorsports has been helping riders outfit their dirt bikes for more than 30 years. Today, Shap Moto offers professional advice online and in-store, helping you find the best riding gear, parts, accessories, and tires for all of your power sports vehicles. Visit shapmoto.com today. That's C-H-A-P-Moto.com. All right, let's dive back into our conversation with Mitch. Uh, we've had a rough go at the last handful of Motocross and Nations races. What are we doing right, and what are we doing wrong? It kind of goes... I think for the U.S. it goes in cycles where the guys get pumped to go and then sometimes they're not pumped to go. And I would say for us, we had like Rhino went in like 95, I think. I think the check. And then Ricky, when he rode for us, um, I think we went 98, 99, and we were excited about it, and but he was excited about it, so it made it easy to want to go do it, and nowadays it's a little bit different in that, you know, I think we've seen, I think RV turned it down one year, right, or not, no, I don't think he did. I think, uh, I know Dunge turned it down in one year. Marvin's turned it down one year. Tomex turned it down one year. And I wonder if that's, well, part of it is because of, I think Eldon's boot camp starts early and he doesn't want them racing. And the other maybe is that they want a little bit of time off after the series. And the other thing is, Supercross is a, probably a little bit more important and like two weeks later, there's the Monster Cup and there's a million dollars. And the manufacturers want those guys to go to that race and they want them to try to do good. And then you go to this one race where there's no prize money. It is the Olympics. That's the best thing about it. We've done it before and it's been a blast, but it needs to be it needs to be fun for the riders to where win or lose they kind of have a little bit of an experience with it where it's fun and then I thought it was better in the past somehow where we used to park together and I've always I've had an opinion about that and we sort of get separated now where the three riders are just all over the pits I'm like, I don't think we can do that. The other guys are good, and we need to work together as a group. Yeah, keep the communication good? Well, 
those three, can you if if you got our three best riders in the country, you would think that one of the three of them can show the other guy a couple of good lines and vice versa and all that and then guys all over the track what did you see and all that and if they're if if we're not together like you're just you know winging it and i don't think you can wing it i think it's it's uh, it's a hard event and the euros are good at outdoors you know they they don't race supercross and i think it would be a good idea every once in a while once again my idea we should do a supercross donations they can all come over here and race a supercross every country would you have to tame it down though why they don't tame it tame down the outdoors send it (laughs) three long set of big whoops some sketcher you know on and offs and go for it and then they'll you know it's it's difficult and and truthfully a guy like Hurlings and and Caroli I have a ton of respect for and and those guys they respect the US riders they don't they don't talk shit on them you know they both have common respect but for some of the other ones to have the balls enough to say that our guys are scared to go over there or something like that they're stupid because they can fucking come right Anaheim anytime they want and probably get carried off on a stretcher. So they should be careful. Our guys do 18 supercrosses and then two weeks outdoor testing and then go ride 12 nationals. So we do like 30, 30 races a year. It's a lot. I respect the GP series. I, I, I follow it. I watch the GPs. Mm-hmm. There are some bad dudes over there. But ours is just different now. We split up our time, and we're probably not as perfected, specialized in one or we're the not, other. Yeah, like they're they're specialized in outdoors. They don't care about supercross. It almost looks like a different sport to me watching the, the suspension over there versus our guys here. It's just the era. They're good at what they do. It's like. Like road racing, I don't think you can take a U.S. like a, or you can't even take a World Superbike guy and dump him in MotoGP and expect him to kill it because half the reason guys are in World Superbike is they didn't make it. So like you just get into that, it's so specialized in every class anymore. So I don't know. Donations, I like it, but. It would be nice to do it better and then, or don't do it. You know, do it better or don't do it. Because it's, you know, the, I feel bad for the riders, like I said, because they're going to go to, if, if they go to Motocross Donations, is there one week off or two weeks off until Monster Cup this year? Yeah, it's back to back. So if you go to Red Bud, you're going to ride Motocross Donations and hoop and holler, whoopee, that's awesome. And then they're going to expect you to be in Vegas hitting a supercross track you know like that's hard all right 40 years of racing how long do you do this Uh, 40 years oh me yeah (laughs) Uh, I don't know you got to use Roger as a yardstick if Roger if Raj quits pretty soon, then I only have to do it another 30 <laughs> or something. I don't know. How old is Raj? <laughs> is he? I think he's 70 he's, or 70-ish. Yeah, he's 70-something, right? And he probably started racing when he was how old? 16, 17, maybe? Well, if you count those. Yeah. But if you count the business, I don't know how you count it, but he still got me covered. Now, I, as long as I like it, as long as I enjoy it, and I do, I, I love it. I like, I like trying to win. It, it inspires you. Like, it keeps the blood flowing. If I retired, I'd be bored out of my mind. Well, thanks for helping us break in the podcast here. And, All right. And I appreciate the time. Yep, no problem. That's it for episode one of The Inside Line, presented by Thor. We hope you dug the conversation with Mitch. I know I did. 
Ready for some more bench racing? Look for the next one soon. We're working to bring you one of these every two weeks, but we may sneak the next one out a little sooner than that. In the meantime, hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform so that you don't miss any episodes. See ya!